Thanks, Christine. And I, I think actually that makes a really important point that taxation does raise issues that go to the heart of the rules and norms mm. that mm. hold societies together. And I guess one of the things that you were grappling with, Michael, in the negotiations is that we have a global economic system which lends itself very readily to tax evasion. But we don't have rules and regulations and institutions that can underpin, you know, what I think we would all describe as, as a tax justice system. Mm. And on the subject of tax justice, Michael. I've already got oh, sorry, one minute. <laughs> no, no, sorry, you've got, you've got at least eight. I, I'm not actually speaking for the Tax Justice Network this afternoon. This is very much a, a, a me um, performance, I'm afraid, under the Tax Research UK banner, if you like, because these are my personal opinions. The G8 provided me with one definite new experience, which was um, having Nick Robinson summarise my sentiments on the Today programme, which was slightly mm. surprising when you hear that. Mm. Um, and it was quite odd to hear him say, I spoke to Richard Murphy and he both thinks this is going to be a turning point and he's going to be deeply disappointed by it. <laughs> <laughs> and in a sense, that is exactly how I do feel about the G8. Because it was a turning point. I mean, I agree with George Osborne for once. Um, yeah, we did achieve, the G8 did achieve an enormous amount. And after 10 years of campaigning on tax justice, because the Tax Justice Network began in 2003, and I wrote the first version of Country by Country Reporting in January 2003, to suddenly hear the world's leaders endorsing something that you've written about for 10 years, and today I discovered I'd just written my 10,000th blog on the subject, mm. which is kind of sad, isn't mm. it? That's 3.8 a day for the last seven years I've done. Um, you know, to discover that actually they've listened at long last to all that output, then you feel excited because I think the G8 is a turning point in the sense that it can never again be said that tax is not important, that multinational companies have not avoided tax, that transparency is not key to going forward, that data is fundamental to making sure that developing countries can have the taxing rights that they deserve. All of those things have now been agreed. And at the same time, of course, I would have loved that locker and declaration to have a few more wills and shalls rather than shoulds in it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there are 13 shoulds in there. And in that sense, of course, we're now looking at how do we turn those shoulds into shalls. And in a political economy sense, of course, that's now the challenge. That we have to take what are some quite surprising commitments. Things that two years ago... Um, well, I wouldn't have given my right arm for, but, you know, met metaphorically, I might have done. Um, I would have loved to have seen we've actually got. Uh, and we have a platform now for change. And I think that is what the G8 represents. And also the G20 and even, to some extent, the BEPS programme. I mean, where I, you know, conceptually, I don't agree with the OECD on many tax issues. And yet, there are elements within it which I see help us go forward. And that's what I want to flag up. Because at this point... We've now won some of the arguments, but we have to remember that actually some of the arguments that went to the G8 were only partial. For example, the world now thinks that most tax problems relate to multinational companies, and I hate to tell you this, but actually they don't. Mm. Having spent so long persuading the world that actually multinational companies are really important, and I actually I wrote mm. the first ever story about mm. Google as well, um, at, oh, and Microsoft, mm. um, and you know, it was involved in those a long time ago. Um, They've been great for getting the issue on the public agenda, but actually domestic tax evasion around the world is much more important. You know, my, the European Union's estimate of tax loss, the tax gap, difference between tax that should be collected and tax that is collected, is one trillion dollars. And that was, uh, euro, sorry, and that was estimated in my um, back garden um, by me. Um, and <laughs> in an odd moment, in between walking the dog um, and doing a lot of stats. And uh, 150 billion euros is tax avoidance and 850 is tax evasion. Mm. So, for example, you know, we've really got to pick up other issues as well. So I'm making it clear that the importance of the G8 is, we've also now got to highlight the fact that in developing countries and in our economy, there are still issues that this in many ways, is not going very near. Automatic information exchange helps. And the challenge now is to actually see how can we actually use the political consensus that has been created to create the behavioural changes that will result in tax being collected, both by avoidance and by evasion. 
Now, country by country reporting was always designed to embarrass companies into actually paying tax in the right place at the right time by providing the data that they weren't. And that's why we put so much effort into putting uh, companies onto the front page of the Financial Times or wherever else. It was worth it because it clearly achieved a result. But we now need to actually translate this into ordinary companies. I mean, one of the, th and, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things we can do. One is we need to do some deep research. And I was talking earlier this afternoon on this point, and somebody point, uh, suggested I might be a pointy-headed pointy geek. Well, I don't mind being a pointy-headed geek if it results in tax being paid in the right place. And we don't have austerity. We do have education programs in developing countries. We have health. I think that's worth being a pointy-headed geek for. Now, that means country-by-country country reporting has to not just be a program for tax administrations, but in due course, we still have to keep up the argument it has to be on public record too. We have to argue that if there's automatic information exchange, it really has to produce the right information. And as others have said, people can use it. Beneficial ownership information, who really owns companies, has to be on public record. So please do submit to this um, mm. biz, um, and it's 100 pages, the document, but find out a way of you know, reducing that 100 pages and making a submission. And create the political debate. I mean, I've just tried to make my own contribution. I'm going to give it a shameless plug, a bill that was published in the House of Commons last night. Um, with the, the nice and short brief title of the United Kingdom Corporate and Individual Tax and Financial Transparency Bill. God, we should have done better than that. <laughs> Doesn't even make a nice summary. But it's challenging on some of these issues. Why, Michael Meacher is proposing it as a private member's bill, but it's got backings from Liberal Democrats and well, our one and only Green MP, so Caroline Lucas has her name on it too. And it's trying to actually suggest that we can pass legislation to achieve these goals that the, have been endorsed by our leaders. So it demands that large companies publish accounts of all their subsidiaries. It demands that we disclose the beneficial ownership of companies and puts sanctions into place for those companies that don't, most importantly. Like leaving the directors personally liable for the tax and what is more requiring UK banks to advise companies house of when they've opened a bank account for a company and who they think owns it because if any of you have ever opened a bank account for a company you know you have to prove that under anti-money laundering rules so the data exists we need to get it out there so we can use it um, for the first time in 46 years this piece of legislation um, is before the um, House of Commons and actually imposes law upon Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands and others, and um, I managed to get it past the parliamentary draftsman who said we could do that. It hasn't happened since 1967 when it was put down to actually stop Radio Caroline broadcasting from the Isle of Man. For those of you who are old enough to remember Radio Caroline, hands up. <laughs> so now we put it down. Will it become law? No, of course it won't. But the point now is that we have achieved a momentous political event. The G8 is that. And I have to give credit to David Cameron, even if he wouldn't answer my question at his press conference at Lockdown. <laughs> Pointedly ignored me all the way through. <laughs> but we did make a change, and he has to take credit, I think, personally, for pushing this up the agenda, and I give him credit for that. But now our job is to keep the pressure up to deliver the real change, which is going to actually deliver the change on the ground. And here... My plea is that lots of people have got to understand that actually this is going to now be a technical process at the same time as it is a pressure point process. Mm. Because this sort of very boring stuff um, of writing technical legislation, working out accounting stuff and so on, is now going to make a difference. Not just here, but as I was discussing earlier on about how does land transparency become real in Tanzania. Mm. Because without actually understanding that sort of technical stuff in each of the countries around the world, translating this into reality so people get the information they need to live better lives because they are supported in their legal rights and because they have the resources of government behind them provided by fair taxation. If we don't achieve that, then the promise of the G8 won't be delivered. Now, I believe that's possible. I believe we can do that. The pressure is, however, still essential. And that's mm -hmm. the next stage of this process, is understanding that we now have to move on from where we are. And the challenge is, therefore, for those communities, like the Tax Justice Network, Christian Aid Action Aid, where, by and large, this has been a black and white agenda to date. It has been. You know, large companies bad, have been tax avoiders. Well, actually, they're not all of them. Mm. Some of them are actually OK. And some are even got some quite decent people who are going to try and transform this agenda, too. And now we have to build different partnerships to actually prove how we deliver. 
And that's when it really becomes important because delivery is the key to mm. success. Thank you, Richard. Mm. Um, and and we, uh, we don't think you're a pointy headed geek at all. Well, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say it was you that said it. <laughs> So th th I, I said thank you for all of you for great presentations and this is an opportunity to you know to, to ask whatever you want to ask. Um, you know I'm I'm struck by one thing that I think in the same way that this summit has really started to transform the wider development agenda, I think it also challenges us to think about development itself in a slightly different mm. way, because some of these issues you know my colleague Andy Norton and Anna here are working on land issues in developing countries. And greater transparency on land in developing countries would, I think, throw a spotlight not just on the practices of international investors and international speculators, but more especially on national elites. Yes. And exactly the same is true of taxation. You know, I was very struck, actually, by Justine Greening's comments on Pakistan recently and the programme that's been opened in Pakistan, which is to really put revenue collection at the center of development cooperation. And again, it, you know, it has to be said, I, I think I'm allowed to say this, you know, that if you compare the commercial elite or the wealthy, the, you know, the richest 10% in Pakistan to Google and Starbucks, you know, they, they would make them look amateurs. You know, this, is a, this is a country that is a tax system designed to facilitate eva um, evasion. So, you know, I, d I do think it puts some of these questions very squarely at the centre of the, of the wider development agenda, and perhaps we can take mm. some of those issues up in discussion. So 